coming up on this episode of The Roundtable. How much of the laptop or white collar economy do you think const- is, is bullshit jobs? Especially, um, and especially uh, versus sort of the more real, you know, hard asset manufacturing economy of something you know well, having run a manufacturing business. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, bullshit jobs, and you, everyone should read David Graeber's book and my review of it by, by the same name. Bullshit jobs can be divided into parasitical jobs and jobs, for example, just paper pushing that don't actually do anything, uh, and ones that are overtly destructive of social capital, such as most uh, university educators or gender studies people or, or what have you. But the short answer to your question is, in my experience, I think it a, a safe figure to say 85 to 90% of white collar jobs in America are uh, purely parasitical. And if they disappeared, <laughs> the economy would increase the real economy calculated appropriately, not the fake GDP figures, which obviously include salaries to people like that. Uh, would not only you know, not go down, but would increase. What you do with those people and what they would do, of course, is a, a different social problem, but right. a, a huge percentage is the answer. Hello, and welcome to Roundtable 2.0, the new, updated, hardcore-only, late-hours political commentary. I have selected only those members of the American Mind editorial team that were willing to commit to working around the clock to bringing you top-notch, leaned-down Roundtable commentary. No, I'm joking. It's just the regular old Roundtable. I'm your regular old host, Spencer Clavin, features editor of The American Mind and associate editor of the Paramount Review of Books. And I am joined this week by managing editor Seth Barron, associate editor Helen Roy, and publisher and president Ryan Williams. James Hulas is out. We wish him a very happy Thanksgiving vacation, as we will all soon be uh, gathering, hopefully with friends and family. Maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later. And we will have a special guest, Charles Haywood, in just a bit. But let me first lay out the topic for today, which is Twitter 2.0. That's what I was joking about at the beginning of my introduction. Thought it would be good to give a little survey of the Elon Musk era as it begins to set in at Twitter, what it portends for the future, not just of the platform itself, but also the ongoing argument over big tech, free speech, platforming and deplatforming, so on and so forth. Let's start, I think, with the reinstatements. I wanted to talk a little bit about the people that are now back on Twitter and also about the, you might call it a philosophy, you might call it a kind of grab bag of opinions about who should speak and how that Musk seems to be developing in real time. I'm interested to hear you guys' thoughts about this, in fact, because as of right now, a few kind of major reinstatements that we have seen. The big one, obviously, Donald Trump, Uh, is back after a 15 million vote survey. Musk uh, surveyed over 15 million people about whether he should come back on. Narrowly, the people voted yes. Trump is back, but he has yet to tweet uh, because he's on Truth Social. And I guess he's still, he's either just lurking or he's completely ignoring the whole thing as a flex about uh, his own platform. Um, We've also got the Babylon Bee who kind of kicked off this whole thing by tweeting at Elon and having this interaction about their uh, restrictions. They're they're getting kicked off for having said that Rachel Levine is a man. Jordan Peterson's back. So is Kathy Griffin, who I guess had a picture of herself decapitating, fake decapitating President Trump, among other infractions, um, but no Alex Jones. And so there have been some questions raised. Alex Jones, obviously, the, you know, massive YouTuber of Info Infowars, who ran into trouble about the Sandy Hook shooting, the he was sort of indulging in conspiracy theories about that shooting, which people may be familiar with. In any case, he has become kind of a flashpoint question mark for people about free speech, because, you know, even folks that you can find him appealing and like him. Also, many of them were kind of 
put off by his Sandy Hook stuff uh, or even repulsed by it. Musk seems to be repulsed by it. He tweeted in response to somebody's question about this that, you know, he had had a child die. And so, you know, he was not going to let anybody traffic in the deaths of children for political points. Um, but of course, this raises the whole old set of questions. If it's free speech, isn't it free for you know, even people we find unappealing or repulsive, you know, what about the Nazis marching, marching in Skokie and all the classic cases? I mean, Alex Jones has kind of become his own little locus classicus for this debate in the online era. And Musk's sort of stated policy as of right now is uh, freedom of speech, but not freedom of reach. New Twitter policy, he tweeted on uh, recently, uh, new Twitter policy is freedom of speech, not freedom of reach. Negative slash hate tweets will be max deboosted and demonetized. So no ads or other revenue to Twitter. Let me open it up now. <laughs> I am having a hard time. I, I aesthetically sympathize with Musk. He, I find him appealing. I have hopes about what he, you know, he's at least kind of more on uh, the side that I would like to see the CEO of Twitter be on this topic. But I am I'm having a hard time here discerning what the difference is between this and what we had before, except that we have somebody kind of more like, you know, friendly, ostensibly currently to like, quote unquote, our guys than before with sort of different opinions that we like better rather than a sort of hard line philosophy that freedom of speech means freedom of speech. What do you guys make of it? Well, first, Spencer, I just want to say you, you I think you're underselling a bit uh, Alex Jones's troubles. You said he ran into a bit of trouble. For, oh for well, right. I sorry. Yeah, he was completely I mean, erased. Last from I the checked, internet. he's racking up a trillion dollars in a defamation suit. Uh, yeah, anyway, yeah. in damages, oh, but boy. um, yeah. No, I I think I, I don't know. I think you put it well, Spencer. I think it's uh, I think it's the same old Twitter, just with a different sheriff in town. Um, we'll see if Elon stumbles his way into a more principled position, but um, uh, I don't know. It'll I it's it. It's an improvement to be sure. And I, I will state also that, you know, this gets gets back to an interesting question that um, the Claremont Institute, uh, you know, we're, we're not uh, we're not in favor of uh, we're not free speech absolutists here at the Claremont Institute, whether it be on campus or elsewhere. I mean, the long tradition going back to the American founding is that uh, it's not a free speech absolutism. You, you know, you have a property in your reputation so you can sue for defamation. Uh, I think we would like to see New York Times v. Sullivan modified significantly or overturned. That is to say, we should be able to sue the media for defamation, libel, and slander uh, more than we currently can. You know, some happy medium between the um, somewhat arbitrary and capricious rules, say in Great Britain and uh, back towards the founding. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, it's it's an improvement. We'll, we'll see how it all shakes out. Um, it's, it's, it's fun to watch it all work, <laughs> that's for sure, mm -hmm. or to observe the kind of scrum as everyone argues and uh, criticizes Elon and et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I, Musk, Musk is a mixed bag for me. I think on the level of personnel, he's, you know, great for us. He's removed the openly creepy, effeminate, and odious disinformation czars. Mm -hmm. And this sort of reflects what's happening on the level of ideology, which is that, you know, the explicit leftism is gone, but it's replaced by what Elon sort of and Joe Rogan also sort of put out there as like set, radical centrism, like no ideology. But for most people, that's actually just implicit left, leftism. So I, I don't know. I almost wonder if this is I mean, I think it's good on the whole, but there's there's a sort of slipperiness to what's happening um, uh, that I think maybe people on our side, conservatives will think, oh, this is a good thing through and through, but there's just some, there, there might be some tripwires, some things to watch out for a little deeper down. Also to tap into my like schizo suburban mom meme, <laughs> I just don't like his Halloween costume. He like dressed up as Lucifer. I think that's creepy, but I guess um, that's less to do with this policy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's not totally unrelated, actually, because there's a whole host of, you know, I was trying to kind of dance around this a little in my intro before we really got into it. But there's a whole host of like, you know, ideological aesthetic questions about Musk that really hold the 
people on the right back from like owning him as one of our guys, right? Like yeah. the thing, the, you know, the Neuralink stuff, the kind of techno futurist, verging on transhumanist stuff is all like still there in the background. Having a bunch it's of more kids out like, of wedlock because you want high IQ babies, you know, yes. right? yeah, all right. this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I would ag I agree with um with Helen and Ryan. I mean, look, it, it's it's definitely fun because he's angering so many of our enemies and driving them crazy. But he's a provocateur. So you know, he obviously enjoys skewering people. He has, you know, he can leverage like hundreds of billions of dollars of wealth or value to you know put himself into strange positions of enormous power and um but you know there's no there's no it's it's i don't think it's it's not principled i mean he's some kind of like libertarian i mean basically i'm sure his politics are fairly liberal you know with a kind of meritocratic elitism you know where he wants to see like the best and brightest kind of running things which you know i mean there's an argument to be made for that but Right. I mean, I, I, I would say, I, like I've said this before, ever since I heard him say that, like, it's a virtual certainty that we are living in a, simu in a, in a simulation of, you know, some computer thousands of years in the future, and that there's almost a 0% a chance that this isn't true. I've been like, what the hell is with this guy? I mean, did he like take too much ayahuasca? I mean, <laughs> I, I, I th like that whole argument, this simulation argument, which seems very popular now uh, among a certain type, just leaves me a little cold, and and it, it just seems like a totally bizarre thing to um to to, to, to spout. <laughs> but yeah, look, I mean, regarding free speech, I mean, what what was he going to do? Say. Yes, anyone who wants to deny the Holocaust and encourage, you know, child marriage and promote any kind of lunatic ideas is free to to take my platform and just run with it. I mean, it it seems a little like fantastical. I mean, it's kind of like setting up the chaz in seattle like yeah. like an autonomous zone where everything goes i mean okay well i don't know how long that would last so you know as far as alex jones goes i don't know i mean alex jones had like a platform for like decades that was very popular i'm not saying i agree that he should be like i mean i think the billion dollar settlements seem a little ridiculous and clearly there was like a major effort to get him, but I don't know if it, I, I'm, I'm just not going to cry if Alex Jones isn't permitted on Twitter, but you know, that's me. Okay. We're going to come back to the speech element of this and the philosophical aspect of it in a sec circle, circle back, as they say at the end. So we're joined now by Charles Haywood of The Worthy House. If you haven't yet checked this site out, it's just theworthyhouse.com, and you can subscribe for free. Really great uh, you know, writing and commentary and links to other stuff that you might find interesting. So if you like this show, if you like the Claremont Institute, you will definitely be interested in The Worthy House. And I think you will certainly be interested in Charles' latest viral thread um this is kind of we're moving now more i guess into the business side of this whole twitter 2.0 situation um i mentioned or i you know joked in, in my intro about this now sort of infamous email that musk sent uh late at night to his employees about how you know going forward it's going to be really hardcore you're going to have to work super late um you know it, it, this is a new form of twitter that will quote need to be extremely hardcore um, it's going to be engineer driven, only exceptional performance will constitute a passing grade and so on and so forth. And so this kind of reflected the, you know, new leaner approach that Musk wanted to take to Twitter, which, as I understand it, was in fact losing money. So he's got to do something, right? He's got to make some money here <laughs> to say that there ensued a meltdown on Twitter would be to do a disservice to meltdowns. I mean, I <laughs> logged on the night that this was sort of happening 
And it was as if like, not only was Twitter about to go completely black, like as if the code was just going to vanish from the internet and the servers were going to collapse. Um, but also as if that event was tantamount to like, you know, nuclear, you know, nuclear international war. Like that was, it, it was really, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating here. It was now, of course, we know that things are basically trekking along, at least for the time being. And Charles has this thread, which you can find uh, at, at The Worthy House, uh, in which he says, I will now examine Twitter's past financials and predict the future from them. I conclude the criticism of Elon Musk is bizarrely off base because Musk has overnight changed Twitter's net profit margin from negative 20 percent to approximately plus 28 percent more than Apple or Google. So this is based on documents freely available at the SEC's website, annualized percentages based on Twitter's most recent quarterly filings. Um, annual revenue was about 4.4 billion, um, and fell into four major buckets, uh, expenses, sorry, fell into four major buckets, a cost of revenue, R and D sales and marketing in general and administrative. So based on sort of sketching out uh, some estimates of what Musk, you know, might be up to and talking to people sort of with a little bit more inside information, Charles writes, the vast majority of 63% of Twitter's expenses are personnel costs. If we assume primarily is 80% and that 20% of costs of revenue is also personnel costs, 58% of Twitter's total costs are personnel costs. Your mileage may vary, but this means that when Musk took over, Twitter had 7,500 employees. Let's guess 70% of those have left, leaving aside pay differentials. That, that suggests that Twitter's expenses have likely permanently dropped 41% overnight. That makes its new annualized projected profit 1.3 billion. So Charles, as I, as I read you here, these are kind of back of envelope calculations. You're at 16.3 thousand likes. This is kind of cutting through <laughs> a lot of the nonsense. I think remarkably so, since as you, as you pointed out to me, like this is not, this was you know, not, not a gargantuan kind of active investigative journalism, but it is really fascinating. Have I left anything out of your argument here? Um, and what do you think we can draw from these uh, estimations? You haven't left anything crucial out of the argument, and I think you're precisely right. This is essentially a trivial analysis. I mean, yes, it's as I say, your mileage may vary, and there's certain assumptions and so on. But the general thrust of the analysis is completely indisputable, which is you know, demonstrable by the fact that no one has disputed it. And you know, whatever how many <laughs> thousand comments there are, I mean, the comments all are the usual mix of ignorance and malice, and and that's why I kind of sat down to do this, which took me, you know, 15 minutes and publicly documented filings is because everybody on in the financial press, shall we say, or you know, whatever, wherever you get your news, pretty much everything about Twitter, I mean, you gave the most prominent example, which is the ludicrous idea, which I called ludicrous at the time that Twitter was going to shut down. But everything is a basically a stew of ignorance, or rather it's ignorance tinged with or shading into malice. So you, you nothing that you read makes any sense at all because no one sits down and does the basic analysis. And the basic analysis, as I say, is that if you get set rid of 70% of the people, you basically make the company very profitable overnight. Now, admittedly, and the only substantive criticism one might make is that that ignores the debt costs, which I, the cost of carrying the debt and paying the interest, which uh, I do make a nod to, but it's, it's basic financial analysis that when you're valuing a company, you ignore its financing structure because that debt could also be swapped for equity and then it, would, it wouldn't change the profitability at all. So basically, it, it just proves the point which everyone viscerally knows, but for some reason, nobody bothers to sit down and trivially prove, which is that getting rid of all this dead weight at tech companies, all companies in general, in my experience, which is, you know, I have personal experience in business. But if you get rid of the dead weight, which is extremely significant at these tech companies, more so than say a manufacturing company, you just automatically make jillions of dollars overnight. And this is a everybody kind of knows this, but the collective suppression or suspension of disbelief that uh, the Musk has kind of broken the spell for. I think is extremely powerful. I mean, certainly his enemies will be even more out to get him as a result of making this demonstration. But my money, as I've always said, is is still on Musk. Charles, um, I'm wondering what about the question of revenue? I mean, because it does seem as though 
uh, a number of advertisers have moved away from Twitter. And, you know, I do notice that the um, quality of the advertising of, or of his advertisers seems to have fallen quite a bit. I mean, that's that's another line in the um, in the balance sheet. Right. I mean, do, do you do you, does that I mean, change your calculations? It doesn't. I, I advert to this as well. It not, it's not something that Seth talked about, but certainly, all other things being equal, if revenue goes down, uh, your profit goes down. And this is a, a obviously a risk for Musk. I, I can't say personally about the advertising because I use the Brave browser, which automatically on the desktop, which I automatically suppresses all ads on uh -huh. Twitter. Sorry, okay. um, and I, I don't have Twitter on my phone because that way lies madness. <laughs> but um, uh, but I uh, I think the that is a potential problem. It is a little bit. I think my opinion, and unlike my analysis, it's it's just my opinion rather than something that I can really point to. Something is that advertisers will return and probably increase their ad buy as as Twitter becomes a more desirable platform for a variety of reasons. As this is no longer the current thing, and it's also possible, however, that the the left wing domination of uh, corporations in general and the soft aspect of corporations such as HR and advertising will allow them, in combination with third party pressure groups like the loathsome ADL, to pull advertising on a permanent basis from Twitter, which could cause Musk huge problems. On the other hand, you can, to a certain extent, first of all, if you've cut out a billion three or whatever of expenses, you have some room to uh, to fall down that you didn't have before. You also have a variety of other ways that you can raise revenue. Obviously, the subscription model is something that Musk is is testing out in various ways, and, and people kind of laugh at him. But all the people who are laughing at him for what are perceived as missteps are the kind of people who have never taken a risk in their lives and have are basically a bunch of clueless, ignorant people. I mean, this is the way a successful person approaches a business. He just has to do it more publicly than most people. So it's entirely possible that subscription or other revenue streams or modifications to the platform, He, for example, last night he was talking about video and things like that would, would more than fill in the gap. I mean, you have to remember that even if Twitter is losing money and is losing significant money, there's ways to fill that hole and not just Musk doing it personally. Many, I mean, Amazon famously lost tens or hundreds of billions of dollars for many, many years every year before it became profitable. You don't, you can lose money. And given Musk's successful track record, I mean, look, I like Musk. I think he exists in that twilight zone between visionary and con man. Uh, but and I don't, I, for example, I don't think that driverless cars will, are ever going to arrive. I think that's just a ludicrous fiction. But the fact is, he's been extremely successful, and yeah, maybe some of that is based upon levitating unreality or something like a Steve Jobs reality distortion field, or something like that. But the fact is that you're always historically going to lose money betting against Musk's ability to beat down his his enemies. There are other threats for example the uh, apple or google taking the twitter app out of the app store i mean those things are, are significant threats uh, it's you know i i have various opinions about um you know what that shows about our society as a whole but on the other hand if you're apple or google it's not clear that that's a safe bet that you may end up harming yourself more by doing that and not just because he'll find some way around it, but because he may undercut your entire business model just because he's in a bad mood. So uh, again, it's hard to predict the future. And yes, it's true that revenue could go down. That might be a problem. But uh, I think that a a man who was looking at history and kind of what's happened in the past month uh, would bet on Musk overcoming whatever those challenges might be. Charles, I, I uh, one question for you, given it's given the fact that it's one of your great themes at the Worthy House and elsewhere. So <laughs> it's extraordinary, right? I mean, we're not surprised really uh, that 70% of, of tech companies are filled with bullshit jobs, uh, for lack of a better term. How much of the laptop or white collar economy do you think const is, is bullshit jobs? Especially, um, and especially uh, versus sort of the more real, you know, hard asset 
manufacturing economy is something you know well, having run a manufacturing business. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, bullshit jobs, and you, everyone should read David Graeber's book and my review of it by, by the same name. Bullshit jobs can be divided into parasitical jobs and jobs, for example, just paper pushing that don't actually do anything, uh, and ones that are overtly destructive of social capital, such as most uh, university educators or gender studies people or, or what have you. But the short answer to your question is, in my experience, I think it a, a safe figure to say 85 to 90% of white collar jobs in America are uh, purely parasitical. And if they disappeared, <laughs> the economy would increase the real economy calculated appropriately, not the fake GDP figures, which obviously include salaries to people like that. Uh, would not only you know, not go down, but would increase. What you do with those people and what they would do, of course, is a, a different social problem. But right. a, a huge percentage is the answer. Because Twitter, it's probably only 70% because Twitter actually is a tech platform that does stuff and needs actual software coders. But uh, there's plenty of other businesses where there's basically no there there. They're just a conduit from people who provide actual goods and services to buyers of those goods and services, but with a huge parasitical sandwich in between. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. This is something that uh, Inez Stepman, another friend of friend of the pod, uh, tweeted that I found really interesting was that the intensity of the reaction to what Musk is doing, which Charles, you rightly say, is full of ignorance and spite. But the the you know the extremity of it might in fact suggest that this the real problem with this is not what it would do to Twitter, but that it serves as kind of proof of concept that if he succeeds, this is basically something you could do at any company, any company of of Twitter's sort of variety, um, which does seem like you know a much larger social form of like social commentary via business management than just like are we going to get funny tweet threads or not. Absolutely. I mean, I think the that explains a large degree of it, combined, of course, with fear of Musk's politics, which of course are somewhat ambiguous. The I think that the degree of fear is much more extreme than is even visible. It's an emperor's new clothes kind of thing. And it's not just fear of those employees. It's fear of the entire fake Oh, not fake, but uh, malicious, to use the same word again, superstructure of NGOs and so on, all these people who provide no value, but whose, whose rent is paid by paras being parasitical, in essence, off of uh, people who are productive. So it's not just the people who are employed by these companies. There's other people who are not employed by an operating company at all. That is, they're employed by nonprofits of some kind who are also exposed to the possibility of people realizing that what they do is completely worthless, even within their nonprofit frame. And th those people are the kind of cancer on society that causes a lot of our problems. If they can't do what they do, uh, that's going to be a big problem for them. Well, you know, it's really funny because it's really like this is what regime change really would look like. Um, because most of these people were not necessarily even fired, I gather. A lot of them just left because they sort of realized that the jig was up and like, oh, well, they're not going to need like 700 people just kind of as junior commissars tweaking the algorithm to make sure that nothing is said about viruses one day and trans the next day. Oh, well, so I mean, it, you know, the, the rats deserting a sinking ship. It's not really a sinking ship. It's just like, I don't know, a ship where the exterminator is coming. <laughs> and I mean, you, you see what I'm saying? It's it's kind of like it it's like everyone recognizing that, oh, well, they're not gonna they're not gonna need me here anymore. And leaving and it, it doesn't it actually doesn't crater out the company. In fact, it like strengthens it because there's no longer all of this like excess weight on the joists. Right. I mean, it, it, the Gordian, it proves that the Gordian knot solution works, and it also works or would work at the governmental level. I think that's probably the, the underlying fear of a lot of this. I mean, leaving aside the legal protections and the political ramifications, if somebody came in with the power and simply said, I'm firing 90% of the federal government employees and federal government contractors, I'm just shutting off your computers, goodbye, never come around again, the government wouldn't 
collapse at all. Everything would be just fine. And that's this, uh, the same what's true for a private company is mutatis mutandis, also true, or maybe even more true for the government. And when people see this, this is, of course, a dangerous thing. Hmm. As I'm listening to you guys talk about this, the perhaps snarky or perhaps significant, you can tell me what you think. The thing that I'm reflecting on is that there's been this whole thing about like, you know, don't go to college to study the humanities because, you know, you should do something useful. You should you should have an education that you can translate into like value for the world. And it strikes me that like one thing that you are <laughs> illustrating with this vast architecture of like make work is that like <laughs> that's not a, a real comparison, like plenty of tech jobs, plenty of jobs in the so-called useful services are just as like empty as the underwater basket weaving elective yeah. that you might take. It's a much bigger problem than like, oh, the humanities are, are useless. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Charles, it's a great thread and people should check out The Worthy House if they haven't already. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. We'll have you on again. My pleasure. Thank you. So, yeah. OK, now we've got these in some ways, you know, two distinct cultural threads in addition to the economics of it all. Right. Like there's the um, fact that Musk is at, you know, at least not driving the company into the ground the way some of his uh, critics have claimed. And then there's the kind of social implications of that, um, which don't just include, you know, what do you think about free speech? Who should be on? Should Alex Jones or have a platform or not? But also include this like enormous dimension of our work, of our economy, right? That includes like all of these people just kind of being made busy for the sake of being made busy and being made to feel like important, maybe more importantly, for this for the sake of it. Um, and Charles kind of alluded to something that I wanted to talk with you guys about, which is, you know, OK, so there's all these useless jobs out there. There's like people in these useless jobs, but those aren't useless people, right? Those are Americans. And we like if it's the case that we have this really like rotten architecture within our economy, what is to be done about that? Like socially, economically, what would be a good like way to reorient all of this energy that is currently being spent in, I don't know, like maximizing synergistic interactions between clientele and email lists and so forth? Well, it's funny. Curtis Yarvin has a funny thing some, uh, someplace where he talks about exactly this question. Like, what do you do with all the superfluous elites? Once you have regime change and society is reorganized, you have all these like commissar types or, you know, whatever, social justice types. And, and he said like, well, what they really like to do is work very hard on things that could be mechanized. But, you know, so he, he basically says what we need to do is set up colonies for them to like, I don't know, produce like artisanal artifacts, like, you know, make like, you know, make cheese, make special cheese or beer or like slippers and then sell it to each other. Or, you know, but the main thing is just to keep them away from anything that matters. Like, you know, yeah, exactly. They're Americans. They're our brothers and sisters. You know, we're not going to punish them. Well, just let them sort of like, like set up like, um, you know, like, like arts and craft studios in the countryside somewhere <laughs> and, and, and they can, you know, putter around. I, I think a lot of this would also be solved by getting women out of the workforce. <laughs> um, <laughs> Go off, queen. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, I, I, so many of these bullshit jobs are filled by women, you know, who dominate. And I'm not just saying this, this they do, women dominate HR, um, all of these sort of, uh, I don't know, I wouldn't even call them like high verbal IQ places, but they're just verbal places um, because it's sort of a, the, uh, women are interested in, in more interested in people than things. And so anyway, this is sort of how they've made themselves useful in the sort of technocratic uh, culture that we live in, but it's, but it is all fake. And I think they would be happier and society, women would be happier and society would be better off and men would make more money if uh, they simply, women simply embraced life, life at home and uh, had some children and walked away from the bullshit job. The, uh, the hard stat that helps uh, illustrate Helen's point is that, and that my source here is this piece in the BBC called Prattle of the Sexes. Do women talk more than men? 
on average, women use uh, 20,000 words a day compared to 7,000 for men. So the, oh, oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, I mean, any of us who are, uh, have any sort of experience dating, being married, et cetera, you know, this is sort of a perennial struggle. It's like, yeah. And yeah. you know, it's not even a bad thing. No, like no, I, sure. God sort of made us a particular way and, and children especially need to be constantly, uh, you know, verbally encouraged, like <laughs> in order to start talking, they need to be talked to. I mean, actually, I I think that, and you see this in, in the, the fact that the, uh, not the FDA, but whichever of these bloated institutions sort of sets the standards for children's speech, they over time have just been reducing and reducing and reducing these standards because people aren't actually talking to children in the way that need, they need to be spoken to. So yeah. yeah, get these chatty Cathy's out of the workforce and uh, <laughs> have a lot of problems. My my recent anecdote about this, I, I it's sort of like I I know I, I don't really complain about it, but my four year old, almost four year old, you know, he's a boy, but he, you know, if you don't, he'll say something, and then if, if you don't acknowledge it, and I've tried, you know, the sort of man grunt in response is not enough. He needs validation. <laughs> he'll just keep repeating the phrase over and over again and, and, until you go, Albert, I heard you. Okay, yeah, that's fine. So yeah, it's uh, it's true. No, I uh, evolutionarily it makes total sense, and uh, uh, I'll let I'll let Helen make the argument that women should be out of the workforce. Yeah, yeah precisely. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we have you on. No, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shield <laughs> <But>, maiden moment. <laughs> <laughs> precisely, precisely. No, I mean, I do think you know, I, I, I am returning, turning over in my head this thing about like the the usefulness of the humanities versus the usefulness of tech and i think seth your point about the yarvin kind of philosophy it, it speaks to this also is like are is there a whole class of people sort of like mid-level elite who's who's like best service to the world is in this kind of like you know pre-raphaelite arts and crafts mode of artisanal beers and wallpapers and like we'll just have a kind of whole little set of cottage industries and i i mean and people I, like I, that I, stuff i was gonna say it would be preferable to having them like you know breathing down the neck of of engineers while they're trying to get code done or whatever whatever <laughs> whatever engineers do a cozy <laughs> cozy artisanal gulag yeah exactly <laughs> I mean, but the thing is, it's like you don't want to have a society where the only thing that's valued are like the, you know, the the, the highest IQ engineers. No, and, right. See, this is the thing. Yes, right. Go on. Yes. And what yeah. they do and like that, that, that they have the ultimate value and everybody just has to defer to them because that's like, that's where you wind up with like the Fauci's in charge hmm. uh, and, you know, rule by, by technocrats. You know, so I kind of I, I always take those arguments about, oh, the liberal arts are a waste of time. I mean, well, I mean, the liberal arts are the foundation of the West. Right. I mean, exactly. you don't really just want to throw them out in, you know, in, in um in favor of this, like, you know. Um, you know, techne necessarily. Right. Yes. Well, this is kind of like what I'm your whole problem flirting, it's sort of, well right what i'm doing in in my life but also like what i'm flirting with now in this as i'm thinking this through like you know um there is this annoying conservative line whenever people are talking about oh student loan forgiveness or just the downfall of the academy or whatever you know all concerns that i share but the line is like well we're just sending these kids off to learn like underwater basket weaving or whatever we need them you know learning useful skills and it's like well there is a sense in which, as you say, Seth, like that is also kind of mechanistic and uh, flattened idea about humanity and society, which ultimately will set us on a trajectory, if nothing else, just to being replaced by our own machines. Right. I mean, James, not here. So, like, let me sort of ventriloquize him like that is <laughs> that will not save you that that mode of like, how do I be good at life there that way lies like ultimate kind of extinction of the usefulness of humanity altogether by like things that can do useful things better than us and so if we're just going to set ourselves in a course and make ourselves obsolete in that way that doesn't seem like a good solution to the crisis of the soul but it does seem like some deep level like reform of education altogether Right. Because if you think about it, like what what's a great sort of locus, a hive for bullshit jobs like the modern 
American university, right? These enormous administrative bodies that grow up in this parasitic way and like totally take over with their own logic. The point of the thing, which is to give people some, you know, training in the truth, the good and the beautiful, a North Star to orient them as they go forth to build families and do these other things. I mean, I come back again and again to this TikTok of this girl who says something like, and forgive the language again, but it's like some bitch wanted equality. And so now I have to study for midterms instead of baking banana bread for my five children or something like that, you know, and it's like speaking to what Helen is talking about that, like, really, maybe what we're up against here in, you know, the if you pull on the thread of the bullshit jobs, what you find is that you're up against like a real reconsideration about just what it is to have a good life and to have a good society altogether, which has to do with education, has to do with the, the kind of family matters that Helen is is talking about. Like it's it's much deeper than just like how can Twitter be most profitable? Totally. And I actually I saw a tweet this week about Thanksgiving and and Biden was doing some like Friendsgiving thing with the Marines and hmm. the person tweeted, everybody has Friendsgiving now because nobody has family. And I think that it was pretty, it, it's quite profound, actually. I mean, there has been this deep hollowing out of these, these aspects of society that, that, that cultivate the heart and uh, conviviality, friendship, love, like these beautiful things that make life worth living. These are the things that people have run away from in order to pursue technocratic credential highly credentialed sort of status oriented positions in society <laughs> but it really i think it has profound psychological social effects you know down the line and um and yeah that that is sort of at bottom what we're talking about you have provided me with the perfect segue, Helen. Thank you so much. It's like You're you welcome. That teed me up. <laughs> this uh, is what friends are for. It's almost as, exactly. It's almost as if I told you guys at the beginning what I thought we would do at the end of this episode, and that is go around the table, the round table, if you will, and say what we're thankful for. But Ryan, uh, because he's married to a you know Michelin star chef, I don't I don't know if that's actually <laughs> real, but I have eaten uh, your wife's <laughs> cooking, and it is since since she's listening to this, I can say with all delight that it is out of this world good ryan also wanted to know what we would be uh, making and or eating for thanksgiving since the holiday is coming up and ryan since it's your suggestion why don't we start with you oh yeah well my my joke that i told you guys before the program is uh you know like your aunt aunt will come over or something like that and you have food for 10 people and and she goes well it's amazing amazing spread how did you uh how did you get it all ready so we can all sit down at 5 p.m.? You, it seems like you haven't done tons of cooking today. And, and the joke is, yeah, we've been cooking for a week. So I start, we started Sunday. Uh, I made the gravy last night. My new favorite thing with turkeys is uh, there's no revelation that I, I didn't make it up. Of course, it's, it's an unknown thing is to cut the spine out of them and spatchcock them, uh, which is to lay them much flatter so that they, they cook more evenly. But the uh, time old or... The uh, age-old problem with uh, poultry in general and turkey also is the getting the breast to cook all the way through, as well as the thighs without the dress, the breast drying out because the thighs need to be hotter. So spatchcocking helps. Um, and then uh, a, a typical for us is a, a pork leek mushroom dressing, which I'm going to add some uh, some chestnuts and apples to this year. So that should be great. Uh, the pork in question is pancetta for us. What else? Oh, and mashed potato, Joel Robichon style mashed potatoes, which is mashed potatoes as they should be done the French way, which is uh, it's kind of a, a suspension of potato in butter. So two parts potato, one part butter. Uh, so that'll be fun. And uh, because it is Thanksgiving, however, Ryan, you are obligated to call those freedom potatoes. <laughs> That's right. And three pies this year. Uh, we're going to do uh, a sweet potato pie, which I think is a little better than pumpkin, similar flavor profile. A uh, French silk chocolate pie, which is just a kind of mousse pie, chocolate mousse, mousse-ish pie, and then uh, an apple pie. And the uh, the homemade uh, pie crusts were made by my lovely wife on Sunday, so we're we're off to the races. And what am I thankful for? Um, family, and uh, especially in. And and the ability to talk about things other than politics, you know, our day job, mm -hmm. our day job uh, here at the Claremont Institute is we we argue and write about politics all the time. So it's nice to uh, 
uh, one one of the nice sort of spillover effects of having a mixed political household that is my in-laws do not share my politics is that uh, we avoid politics at high holidays and talk about other stuff which is nice and uh and also we have a um a new baby on the way due january 2nd so i will be thankful if she arrives more or less on time rather than next week which will complicate my life amazing I'm just totally floored by all of that. <laughs> no, I'm like, well, yeah. we all want to come to Ryan's house now for this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, what are you? What are you bringing to Thanksgiving dinner? Um, I'm making my uh, French bean casserole, which is uh, just French beans, and then I make my own cream of mushroom. I don't fry my own onions for the top. That is the <laughs> best part. And, gosh, uh, my. Toddler and I have been working on our on making gummy bears. I recently discovered that you could make gummy bears out of this grass fed beef gelatin that my bodybuilder husband ins insisted that we That's buy. Exciting. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of a unique, fun thing. Um, and then I'll make apple turnovers. Um, Where do you get your? Did you find gummy bear molds online or something, Helen? Yes, I did. Cool. I. Yeah. Yes, I found them on Amazon, and it's such a fun process, actually. Um, we're still perfecting the recipe, but I, I thought I would do this for Christmas presents this year, too, if I really got a good, like, solid Haribo imitation. <laughs> but we'll see. We'll see. Grass-fed gummy bears, that's, uh, that's a new one. I like it. Right? I know. <laughs> I know. This is, like, peak housewife life. <laughs> but... <laughs> And then I'm really grateful this year for my dad because he's been gone for the holidays, deployed over the past five years, like for, you know, three of them or something. He's just had, he's just been gone pretty often. And as I was talking with Spencer earlier, he, uh, he's developed this great relationship with my daughter and it's just so wonderful to see him become a grandfather and it's been really nice so well that's lovely seth oh okay well we're gonna have a um a leg of lamb instead of a turkey mm. um because you know it, it's it, there's not that many of us and uh nobody's that that big a fan of turkey so we'll just have <laughs> a, a roast and vegetables and you know the usual you know i you know I, I i hate to echo everybody else when it comes to the question of gratitude but I guess we're all humans, and so, you know, we're all sort of probably grateful for a lot of the same things, which is, you know, health and loved ones and, uh, you know, living in a, in a relatively safe and secure and prosperous society. And, um, you know, just uh, God gives us a sunset every day and dawn the next morning, and, uh, you know, I'm grateful for all of that. Amen, indeed. Well, I am limited in what I can bring to you. Thanksgiving by what can travel well in a suitcase because we're going out to be with my sister and her kids and uh, my parents will also join us in New York. And so we've been in a lengthy text message exchange between all of us trying to figure out what is needed and what can be brought and so on and so forth. And we finally landed, first of all, on silverware. We will be bringing silverware uh, <laughs> because there's not enough silverware for the table. So we'll bring that. But also we have a bakery here in Nashville that's really bomb. Um, and I'll give them a shout out, even though my guess from looking at the clientele and the servers is that they would not particularly appreciate this podcast very much. <laughs> but they're called Dozen Bakery. And if you're in Nashville, you should check them out because they make the best bread. And so I will get up at uh, some ungodly hour tomorrow to ensure that they don't sell out and go get some bread to bring. And I'm going to make some cookies. I put out a call on Twitter for cookie recipes and got some good suggestions. So I will do that as well. So Christmas, Seth, you, or sorry, Thanksgiving in Brooklyn. Is that right, Spencer? That's right. Thanksgiving yeah. in Brooklyn. And the last time I was in Brooklyn, here's something I'm really grateful for. The last time I was in Brooklyn, the Vax mandate was on and so we couldn't go anywhere we just sort of like sat in our hotel and in my sister's house and we couldn't go inside and it was like starting to get cold and now that will be a little bit more like lax as i understand it so we'll actually get to go do some stuff we're gonna go see the parade so that we can watch santa claus cross Times square which is the time at which and not before you are allowed to play christmas music 
Um, so <laughs> the Friday uh, after Thanksgiving, for those who don't know, is the busiest bar night of the year. Really? Yeah. Really? Because well, everyone, you know, all the college kids are home, and you know, everyone, um, yeah. everyone goes out on Friday. Yeah. So if you've never been out, I mean, you know, we're all, I mean, most of us anyway, Spencer maybe uh, excluded, you know, we're all married. Uh, well, and Spencer not excluded in that sense, but we're, we're lame and we have children and, and so we're, <laughs> we're not going to bars, but Spencer, you should do it in Brooklyn. It should be fun. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's <laughs> a good one. Although I, I become very domestic when I'm with my sister. I'm, I'm, I just become uncle Spencer a hundred percent. Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. Pure uncle mode into my <laughs> veins. Um, and so I'm grateful. Yeah. I'm grateful that like, you know, COVID is, uh, basically in the rear view mirror, despite clinging with white knuckles to every last chance to exert totalitarian control and and i'm grateful very much for the things that uh, i think seth said it really well there's a book that i've been really loving at the end of the year called thomas Traherne's centuries of meditations and he talks about god giving us the world uh, in a new each day that it, we, we own it the way he owns it which is not to possess it uh, but to simply delight in it uh, because we have been given the senses uh, and the heart and the mind uh, with which to do so. So I'm profoundly grateful for that. And uh, I'm grateful. This is the last thing I'll say. I, I had this thought yesterday morning that like, you know, you wake up every morning and there's all sorts of things, problems in the world, problems in your life, whatever. It's remarkable how many of them can be solved by just making things, making something good, making a family, making a, an essay, making a book, uh, making a podcast. I love making things. I love the chance to make things. And I'm extraordinarily grateful for the many, many opportunities that I've had in my life so far to just be about the business of making things. It solves a host of problems and uh, not least among the places where I get to make things is uh, right here at the Claremont Institute. So I'm grateful for you guys mm. too. And before this all becomes just too sappy, I'm going to close, shut this podcast down as <laughs> is my uh, as is my want. So thank you once again for listening to the roundtable. If you want to learn more, visit our websites at AmericanMind.org, Claremont.org, ClaremontReviewOfBooks.com, and our D.C.-based Center for the American Way of Life at DC.Claremont.org. You can donate to support the show at Claremont.org slash donate. And don't forget to rate, review, share, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. When I say rate, I mean five stars only. Thank you very much. If you have any opinion that relates to something other than five stars, you can keep it to yourself. And happy Thanksgiving from the bottom of our hearts to you. Thank you so much for listening. You make what we do worthwhile. Have a great holiday, and we will talk to you next week.